have heard about the Sage project, uh, but uh, we have uh, not spoken much about the Sage 2. Uh, we wanted to do a bunch of activities uh, since uh, from dissemination activities from January, but everything is uh, not possible now. Uh, so I thought I'll give everyone an overview of what's happening in Sage 2. And then, uh, you know, uh, hopefully this will drive conversation on a specific individual aspect of Sage 2, which I can take offline. Uh, so, uh, so the main idea of the Sage 2 project is to tackle uh, three areas. One is uh, looking at classic extreme computing applications, which continuously have changing I.O. needs. And of course, uh, existing hardware cannot keep up. There's a very classic problems that uh, every one of you uh, are aware of. And there is a separate set of, uh, uh, when we were doing the Sage project, we looked at uh, the overlap of extreme computing and big data analysis where uh, we're trying to see, build a story system that where you can also try and avoid data movements for uh, for uh, data intensive HPC applications, uh, try and do uh, in uh, sort of a quote unquote in situ processing within the storage system. Uh, so that helps us to manage and process all these extremely large data sets. So we looked at the overlap of uh, extreme computing and big data analysis in the uh, Sage project. But in the Sage 2 project, what we bring to the table is the uh, AI and deep learning applications. Uh, so uh, it's a uh, uh, which 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 have very unique requirements. Uh, they have very special memory requirements, and uh, the storage and I/O requirements are not were not very clear yet. I mean, and, and it's still evolving. Uh, we're still trying to understand uh, if we can, uh, if there are like different classes of AI and deep learning applications with unique I/O requirements. So we wanted to study that aspect, and we are bringing bringing that into the fold. So uh, that's why I uh, say it's just uh, uh, one storage system to rule them all. So whether we can have a single storage system infrastructure that can deal with all these different types of workflows. So that would be really great uh, for uh, for the data centers and for the community. So this is kind of the overall gist of uh, Sage 2. So at the end of the Sage project, uh, so uh, from 2015 uh, to 2018, uh, so what we have is this uh, multi-tiered storage system that is installed in Ulic Supercomputing Center. So it's uh, it has different types of storage devices. So uh, the top tier is a 3D cross point uh, PCIe block devices in ATOS Boolean servers. And the second tier is uh, SSDs, uh, it's the SSD tier. And the third tier is the uh, enterprise uh, high demand storage tier. And the tier four is the archival tier. And these are there are some local clients. So all these different tiers, uh, they're all managed by an object storage system. So there is no parallel file system. So everything is managed by an object storage system. Uh, so uh, it, it is called Miro, M-E-R-O. Uh, so we are trying to uh, we were trying to explore the usage of object storage not just as a archival tier but also as a scratch uh, for the uh, for for HPC and uh, you know big data analysis type workflows. So we already have that implemented fully. Uh, so and uh, it was uh, we of course had uh, uh, data intensive applications in the Sage project like uh, IPIC 3D and uh, uh, some of the applications from uh, Diamond who, who are who are in the who, who are in the audience today, uh, and there were some applications from uh, UK Atomic en Energy Agency and uh, Ulic Supercomputing Center. So uh, this was developed at Seagate um, and along with the collaboration of ATOS, and uh, we have ported not just the Miro object storage system here, but also the entire stack. Uh, which I'm going to quickly uh, remind everyone uh, about. Uh, so this, at the end of the project, we uh, we mentioned that uh, you know this is also available for external users. So uh, we, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the other projects who are starting to use the Sage pro, uh, Sage prototype, and it's also open for other people to uh, other communities to try out. 
So uh, some of the key takeaways from uh, Sage at that moment was that uh, we uh, introduced the ob Miro object storage system. So it's a bit early. Uh, uh, in, we have been developing Miro for quite some time, uh, starting from scratch. But uh, it's the first time we have big uh, deployments of Miro. Uh, so we are starting to develop the Miro object store as well as its uh, ecosystem components. So this is kind of uh, how the stack uh, looks like. So we these are the different tiers of uh, storage. And the storage system has uh, inbuilt computational capability. So all these tiers, uh, they have x86 cores very close to them. And they are not just running the standard uh, Miro processes, uh, but they're also running uh, other processes as well. So the applications could send snippets of functions or they could do some pre-processing and post-processing. So we, we kind of uh, uh, take hold of uh, existing uh, spare CPU cycles to do some processing in storage. And uh, there's the inverted arrow here, uh, which means that uh, the compute capability uh, reduces as you as we go down the tiers because uh, the high performance storage tiers we envision will always require high uh, there will be high computational needs over there because the data sets are transient and which are always uh, active so the compute capability here is very high that's why we have a uh, bullion servers which are very high in compute and as we go down, the compute capability reduces and the tier four has very minimal computational capability because they're uh, typically just archival grade drives. Uh, so, and uh, this entire object store, uh, which is called Miro, has, uh, we had the API for that, which was called Clovis. And uh, what, what was uh, the Clovis API was a very low level API so which 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 means that you could build higher level semantics easily on top of that so you could build uh, for example uh, a file system on top of that for example we build the pnfs uh, file system we, on top of clovis and it was very easy to plug in like data analytics uh, stacks like apache flink and uh, you could also easily build third party tools so we have a framework in clovis where uh, ISVs uh, or you know, third parties can easily their own uh, frameworks like uh, you know performance uh, tools or data management tools. Uh, in this case, uh, we developed the HSM uh, tool that is able to move data across the tiers uh, based on its uh, usage. Uh, and for the core Miro object store, uh, so everyone is aware of the standard features that are there in uh, most of the most of most of you are aware of it. Uh, but on top of that, we co-designed some additional functions uh, that are typical in data intensive computing. Like for example, we build the feature called layouts, which is able to uh, sprinkle your extents of objects across the different tiers based on its usage. Uh, and then we had the concept of object containers where you group together objects that have similar characteristics and move them across the different tiers. And uh, you had, uh, we introduced the concept of function shipping within the Miro object storage uh, system. And the uh, other aspect that was also there was uh, looking at uh, how you can avoid uh, some of the overheads of MPI IO. So we, look, we looked at so-called uh, MPI windows where you could expose some of these persistent storage, data in these persistent storage tiers directly uh, into memory. And uh, you can use a like a PGAS type programming model to access those data sets directly. So which was kind of like bypassing the IO stack. So it was an interesting argument and uh, we got some uh, good, uh, it was kind of academic. So we got some good uh, publications out of that. So uh, also we had some uh, run times implemented to do like uh, cache management across these tiers uh, and uh, also uh, you know things like that virtual memory uh, hierarchy across these tiers and uh, these were the applications that we looked at that, that I just mentioned. So uh, this is what uh, was there at the uh, end of the stage Sage project and of course it's it's available uh, uh, available now as well. But then. Uh, we started to extend the Sage system. So we continue to work on the same Sage system in Ulic. And it's pretty much most of the partners are the same. 
but uh, we wanted to introduce some new use cases uh, so uh, we had uh, and uh, we are also exploring some work with arm so on top of the uh, existing partners and also sage 2 is a slightly smaller project so uh, we would have really loved to have all the partners in the original sage project but uh, uh, because we, we, since we are focusing on certain aspects uh, we had to uh, bring in uh, some new partners and uh, we could not accommodate all the partners so we have arm uk and uh, we have kitware uh, it's uh, some of the new uh, players here and of course we have our friends uh, from uh, epcc uh, so Adrian, who just uh, gave the talk, uh, is also a part of the Sage 2 consortium as well, and we are glad to have EPCC uh, since uh, they bring in really good knowledge about uh, non-volatile memories. Uh, and uh, even Sage 2, we are trying to explore that uh, from a system-wide perspective. Uh, so uh, the the uh, next gen IO is looking at looking uh, looking at this uh, the non-volatile memories from a very low-level usage perspective. And specifically, it's used in uh, the compute nodes, and uh, we are we are exploring the use of non-volatile memories uh, from a more system-wide perspective. So it's good synergies and very complementary work here going on in the uh, in the Fat HPC uh, community, I would say. Uh, so in terms of uh, innovation, so what's what what exactly we are doing here? So the, the main vision was to extend the storage systems into the compute nodes, uh, similar to what uh, Adrian just uh, spoke about, and uh, blurring the lines between memory and storage. So in this case, got not just uh, resources in the compute nodes, but also the external storage as well. So the question was whether we, we can make everything as part of one big storage system managed by a single software infrastructure. So it's kind of, we talk about so-called blurring the lines between memory and storage. So that was the main question we asked ourselves. Uh, and the four primary innovations uh, that we saw for Sage 2 was uh, compute node local memories would be part of the storage stack. So non, uh, we see more and more non-volatile memories being used uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the big data centers and they, this, they could be used as memories, they could be used uh, with PMDK, they could be ex exposed as block devices. So there's various ways in which you can use them. So uh, how could it be made part of the overall bigger storage system? So we wanted to look at that aspect. And uh, the second aspect is uh, storage being block-based uh, and uh, non-volatile memories and memories being uh, 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 well, it, theoretically, at least, byte addressable. Uh, so, some of the uh, looking at some of the requirements of AI and deep learning, where data sets need to reside in memory, we started asking the question how how the storage system could really help that. So, we started to explore. We wanted to explore the uh, byte addressable extensions into persistent storage. So, whether objects that reside in these tiers can somehow be accessed in a byte addressable way. Of course, uh, there is no magic way of doing that, but the only way to do it is to intelligently map these lower tiers to the higher uh, persistent tiers. Uh, so we looked at uh, ob aspects of uh, mapping these objects to the higher tiers uh, and as and when needed uh, so that uh, essentially you have kind of like a byte addressable view of data. So that's the second thing we wanted to explore. And the other thing uh, is, as I mentioned, uh, co-design with uh, AI and deep learning applications. Uh, so these are uh, not, it, 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 it might not just be a single application, but there's big data analytics pipelines or uh, workflows which have AI and deep learning components of as one of the outcomes that's required out of the data products that come out of one of the elements of the workflow. Um, and then the last but not least was uh, co-design with the uh, ARM-based environments. Uh, so we are working very, uh, so uh, all the system that we built in ULIC was all x86-based uh, uh, systems. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we work very closely with uh, uh, on a separate uh, low-power uh, environment as well. So we started looking at, uh, uh, you know, ARM. 
especially because of all this uh, issue of trying to get to better better power uh, and more much more energy efficiency as we get closer to exascale and storage should really play a big part as well so of course by reducing the movement of data and doing uh, computation close to storage you reduce a lot of uh, the energy overheads of moving data back and forth but also if you can try and keep the energy footprint uh, the power footprint of the storage uh, system itself quite low that would be a great win so that was why we wanted to explore uh, other uh, processing uh, you know technologies as well like arm uh, so this is kind of uh, the uh, uh, kind of the uh, uh, big picture of uh, what's being done in uh, Sage 2. So looking at some of the use use cases that we have for Sage 2, uh, we have a couple of we have uh, AI and uh, deep learning applications from uh, cervical cancer diagnostics, and we have uh, multi-label classification of large videos. So these use cases are uh, uh, brought together by uh, KTH in Sweden. And then we've got uh, brain image data analysis as well from our friends at uh, Ulick Supercomputing Center. And we have from uh, some use cases from uh, uh, from CEA. And what we are doing uh, in Sage2, uh, interestingly, is we are uh, building a TensorFlow port on top of the object store which would make uh, the system very amenable to AI and deep learning applications. So the TensorFlow port is built by CEA uh, and we are looking at some of the applications uh, from them in the area of monitoring. Uh, and we are also looking at uh, radio astronomy data analysis as well uh, from, uh, uh, from, uh, from Ulick Supercomputing Center. And uh, we have we are looking at uh, post-processing some visualization aspects uh, from uh, using tools from Kitware, and uh, we are looking at the multi-physics uh, workflows as well. Uh, so sorry, just, sorry about that. Uh, can you see it okay, uh, Julian and others? My screen. Yes, good. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. I thought I messed up something, but yeah, thanks. So, uh, so this is uh, the the nuclear fusion uh, workflow, for instance. So, which has elements of simulation, which has elements of data post-processing, pre-processing. Uh, so, all and the the data exists in different portions in in memory, in files. So, it it needs to be processed in uh, different ways. So, these are the uh, Sage two uh, use cases. So if you look at uh, what the system that we are building, uh, so so we are expanding the tier one uh, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, additional non-volatile uh, memories with additional 3D cross point uh, uh, PCIe uh, devices. But we are also looking at embellishing some of the compute nodes with uh, NVDIMMs. Uh, DCPMM. Uh, so, uh, so there's going to be some uh, non-volatile memories within the compute nodes. That's going to be part of the storage stack. So, uh, I will explain to you how we envision how how we are trying to use those uh, storage uh, uh, pools. So, uh, the rest of the the lower pieces uh, they uh, they pretty much uh, uh, they pretty much remain the same except that. We are also exploring, we want to explore some uh, very dense devices such as hammer, uh, heat assisted magnetic recording uh, uh, devices from Seagate. Uh, so, so we want to explore some of that. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there are this, there's going to be some storage nodes. Uh, this, there's going to be some clients uh, within the Sage rack itself that are going to drive some localized workloads so that's what we have predominantly been using this is the clients in within the local uh, rack we, we don't bypass we, do, we don't go through the central ulic network but uh, the eventually we want this to be uh, uh, integrated with the ulic compute cluster it's out of the rack so this is a, a kind of a big picture of the proposed system so you have got nvdims and vram uh, then uh, NVMe attached devices. Uh, so yeah, I, I had to mention NVMe as well. 
and flash and sas and uh, archival grade tiers uh, everything essentially uh, managed by the miro object store so in terms of what we are doing from a system stack uh, perspective so we have uh, so i described the use cases and the workflows uh, one thing i also want to mention was that uh, we are building a higher level interface on top of clovis so clovis is very low level as some of you might have experienced and uh, some of the feedback that you gave us so we are building a, a kind of a posix like api on top of clovis that makes it much easier to use of course you can use the posix functionality through pnfs but uh, we are also exploring uh, trying to use like uh, native posix like api on top of clovis on top of the uh, as part of the use cases and uh, what are the different kinds of tools uh, that we are building on top of the object store on top of the system is a uh, we are looking at dcash which is used in the large hadron collider uh, cern uh, federated infrastructure so there's going to be a dcash connector for clovis uh, there's going to be a, a so called io containers which is another way of defining this uh, uh, imposing this containerization on top of objects and we have uh, the machine learning framework tensorflow on top of uh, miro and we are also looking at some uh, uh, application specific plugins for example in this case uh, uh, brought by the uk atomic energy agency uh, high speed object transfer interface and we are also looking at uh, performance analysis tools uh, for example from a uh, uh, that could uh, that could uh, you know uh, utilize the storage system that could uh, be like a, a easy plugin on top of the storage system and uh, also uh, our friends from uh, edinburgh are also looking uh, so adrian uh, spoke about uh, the uh, uh, the slurm interface uh, uh, the slurm scheduler so we are looking at slurm in stage 2 as well uh, so we we are trying to uh, have uh, e easier use of slurm for uh, for directly with clovis applications uh, and uh, also the we are also looking at the miro burst buffer plugin for slurm and uh, as part of the programming models we are looking at uh, uh, basically trying to use a higher level object interface uh, that could be exploited by applications so uh, and then we, for the global memory abstraction so we have this concept of uh, global memory abstraction uh, where it it makes it very easy to use uh, non volatile memories as well as the persistent storage as part of a single unified interface so we have uh, developed the concept of uh, so called uh, um map it's we have developed a special interface so uh, user level memory map io it's called so the interface uh, allows you to map the objects in the persistent uh, tiers uh, directly in memory so it is like memory map but you are actually mapping full objects and there's a lot more control that the user has on the memory mapping as well so we have this higher level interface uh, as part of the global memory abstraction and uh, the lower level in interface of the global memory abstraction makes sure that uh, we can work with uh, the non volatile memory uh, devices uh, uh, easily especially making sure that the lower level uh, uh, the software infrastructure is in place and uh, in terms of the uh, storage core which is miro uh, some of the new features that are look we are looking at is uh, quality of service uh, we have an opportunity to do that in sage 2 so we are looking at uh, using things like fine grain bandwidth throttling on the server side uh, and also trying to use a coarse grain quality of service using the concept of layouts where you could move data to the different tiers based on quality of service semantics and we are also looking at uh, transaction management distributed transaction management uh, some of the, some of uh, some of these aspects uh, transactions have been addressed for example in deos and it it also needs to be addressed in miro and of course we have the uh, we are continuing to expand the uh, in storage compute and function shipping So as part of the miro uh, as part of the miro core 
uh, and uh, in terms of uh, arm so we have got a new arm compute platform uh, with and uh, the thing is pretty equipped with non volatile memories so there's uh, there's quite a bit of work that needs to be done uh, within the arm ecosystem to uh, adapt them to work with non volatile memories uh, so that work is being actively done by arm where uh, the where they're looking at the pmdk extensions uh, pmdk work for uh, nvdms to work with arm and uh, they are also looking at uh, emulate for arm platforms to work with nvdms so this this is something that's going on uh, and of course we've got some uh, arm based clients as well uh, in the sage uh, sage rack now based on thunder x2 so uh, this is kind of the big picture of the sage 2 stack so this is the system looks like today uh, at ulic so we've got the tier ones uh, which is a 3d cross point uh, uh, block based and we and we ram uh, then we've these tiers are the same but we've got some additional clients data warp visualization nodes ocean stores so these are just names of different clients uh, and we've got the uh, under x2 uh, arm based clients as well so we are going to be adding some uh, new arm based uh, servers over here in this rack number 2 uh, and that's going to be uh, our, we need to uh, make sure that uh, miro works with arm so uh, in terms of how the system uh, operates so the applications uh, th there's going to be miro services in the compute nodes of course you could uh, federate all the uh, uh, just like ecofs Adrian was pointing out you could you could federate all the non volatile memory pools expose it as a single tier and have a block interface right you could do that but you could you could have a direct load store of data into memory and you could um, uh, you could basically map the data from all these tiers uh, into memory and uh, the thing is you are mapping full objects so uh, it's uh, not just not files per se so uh, so we have a um map interface that maps uh, persistent uh, 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 persistent data into memory so you could use those uh, you could use work play with objects uh, directly as memory or you could basically expose it as a block device and then use the block uh, api clovis for doing io requests uh, so it's uh, uh, so the data so working with the storage system is going to be both io driven uh, it driven as well as uh, memory style driven so uh, this is kind of the big picture of uh, the sage 2 system operation with uh, miro so where are we at the moment uh, so we've got we've finished the co-design uh, with the applications and we're starting to do the application porting now uh, especially the AI and deep learning applications and uh, for the global memory abstraction we have defined the uh, we have fully defined and implemented the special API for mapping the object uh, so and uh, so there's some other uh, details that are being looked at at the moment and uh, we have the uh, on the same system we have uh, the quality of service on the server side with performance throttling being implemented and also layout space quality of service and as I was mentioning so, so for NVDIM and ARM so there's a PMDK on ARM available and uh, emulation of NVDIM on the ARM platform so uh, we, we're also actively contributing to the uh, mainline Linux kernel as well the our, our team from ARM Uh, and in terms of the uh, design of the uh, ecosystem tools, uh, so we have the Slurm scheduler for Miro, which is in progress, and the TensorFlow for Miro in development, uh, and the Dcache for Miro in development. Uh, so in the POSIX Lite and the IO containers, high-speed object transfer in development. The arming is also something that's uh, in progress. So uh, we we are actively linking, making sure that uh, we link with other projects and also possibly from other initiatives we are we are open to collaborating with uh, uh, initiatives that uh, you know you, uh, you all bring to the table 
so uh, so uh, so we are working also uh, as part of Miro. We are also in uh, the Maestro project, working with Ulix Supercomputing Center, ECMWF, uh, uh, CSCS. So uh, some of our uh, friends from ECMWF, I believe, are on the call today as well. Uh, so we are trying to build, as part of the Miro work, we are building a, a higher level interface on top of Miro to make it easy uh, for usage by this uh, data orchestration middle that is being built as part of the Maestro project. So MIO sits on top of uh, top of Miro, uh, and it's uh, and and this this has also helped us to learn some lessons on building the POSIX Lite API. And MIO is also going to have some features like hints, uh, where you can provide some hints on like data placements and things like that. And uh, for for our friends uh, in the SEV two project, uh, uh, Julian and team, uh, so uh, we are very working very closely on trying to uh, make sure that we can adapt the Miro object store for the weather and climate community, which is a very big player the very important community because of the volumes of data that uh, they have to deal with uh, so uh, so we work with uh, interoperating uh, getting miro interoperation with the uh, earth systems data middleware that's being developed by uh, julian and uh, others the team in the lws2 project and it helps them to uh, work with different data formats and clovis is going to be one of the backend esd uh, among others uh, so also uh, we are working on doing performance optimization of Miro and Clovis specifically for the ESDM and associated data formats. So this is uh, work that is uh, actively in progress. Uh, also, I would like to mention that uh, we have plans to open source Miro. And uh, we, will, we, have, we will be, uh, we, we, we already have an early adopter program. So I would like to just make an announcement here that uh, uh, so we plan to start the adopter program uh, in July 2020. And uh, if, if any of the organizations are interested in having early access to Miro uh, for your own use or for potential contribution uh, to the Miro object store, uh, we very welcome that. Uh, and uh, if, if you're interested, uh, so I'm the liaison for the open source work for Miro for, for Europe. So please get in touch with me. Uh, I'll make sure that uh, you, you're, you're being made part of the program. Uh, so this is something I just wanted to announce to this group. So uh, finally, uh, we also have a good memorandum of understanding with the other projects as well. For example, with Epigram, HS, uh, and the Maestro. So they are going to be using the Sage prototype. And of course, the Eziway project uh, also uh, can uh, will be using the uh, Sage prototype when needed. And uh, we are also looking actively looking for collaborators as well. Uh, so also, of course, uh, EPCC is already part of uh, NextGen IO, and they're already part of Sage too. So uh, some of these are like implicit collaborations. So uh, that's all I've got today. Uh, so I didn't, I did not go into any technical detail uh, today, uh, but uh, feel free to write to me. Uh, you know, we can discuss things over in a separate forum. Uh, so that's uh, that's it from my side. So thanks to Julian and uh, the, uh, and the workshop for giving us a chance to speak. Uh, so that's it from me.